Just take a minute. Look around you. There's history being made. Has been. Will be. How can there not? Just something about those blue skies, high banks and high speed, all coming together in one perfect race. And it'll be here sooner than you think. Roll Tide and welcome to this Thursday edition of Crimson Drive driven by NASCAR. This is Roger Hoover. Great to be with you from our studios in Tuscaloosa as we start to go through today's show looking at Crimson Tide basketball plus looking ahead to what's coming up with football as Alabama of course this Saturday will take on the Ole Miss Rebels and we have a lot coming up on the show not just some basketball talk with Chris Stewart but also soccer talk with Wes Hart but we'll get to everything that's coming up on the show thanks to our friends at RJ Young they're the official technology solution provider of Crimson Drive. They've given us a smart board, so a really interactive way for us to go through all of our headlines, including what's on the show. First things first, we'll hear from the head coach of the Crimson Tide, Nick Saban, with Coach's Checklist as we'll get a rundown on where Alabama stands following the Wednesday practice for the Crimson Tide, gearing up for Saturday and Ole Miss. Then we'll talk to Byron Young, defensive lineman for the Crimson Tide, as we always have one-on-one -on -one conversations with members of the Tide football team, and he'll be along to join us shortly. Then we'll hear from Chris Stewart. As I mentioned, he gets called basketball win Win on Monday. He'll be calling basketball again on Friday against Liberty, as well as filling in for Eli Gold on football play-by-play -play this Saturday against Ole Miss. Calling the game for the Rebels on their radio network will be our friend David Kellum. He'll be along with a look at the Ole Miss Rebels with the other booth. And then Wes Hart, the big picture, will take a look at Alabama soccer as the Crimson Tide are hosting their first ever NCAA tournament game coming up this Friday against Jackson State. A huge honor for Alabama as Coach Hart has guided Alabama to back-to-back -to -back NCAA tournament berths for the first time in school history. Looking at our other headlines with the Crimson Tide football team, of course, trying to continue the winning ways against Ole Miss. Six victories in a row for the Crimson Tide against the Rebels, and the kickoff is set for 2.30 p.m. Central from Vaught-Hemingway Stadium. Our radio coverage from Oxford will start at 11.30 across the network. Lane Kiffin's team, 8-1, got off to an 8-0 start before losing last time out two weeks ago against LSU, 45-20, and the Crimson Tide now 7-2 on the year, 4-2 in SEC play, and of course coming off the loss last week against LSU. Crimson Tide soccer team for the first time this season coming off of a loss. Well, for the first time since early in the year coming off a loss as the winning streak came to an end in the SEC tournament. But we got the good news that Alabama is the number one national seed for the NCAA tournament. Jackson State, champion of the SWAC, will be the opponent coming up on Friday at 6 p.m. That match will be shown on SEC Network Plus as Alabama starts its run to hopefully a national championship. It's been a year of so many firsts for Alabama soccer. Why not keep it going in the NCAA tournament? Also, some final notes from Pensacola. Really good news for Sasha Pickard, McKinley Crone, and Ashlyn Sarepka named the all-tournament team for the SEC tournament. And we'll, we'll be joined by Coach Hart in a few moments to talk about the great play they've had especially goalkeeper McKinley Crone. Crimson Tide basketball, it's been a busy week starting the season. A couple of wins for Alabama women's and men's basketball on Monday at Coleman Coliseum. Now coming up later tonight, it'll be the Crimson Tide women's basketball team at Tulane at 6 p.m. Uh, one and one against Tulane last season. The one loss was early in the year in Tuscaloosa against Tulane and what was actually game two of the season a year ago. But in the women's NIT second round, Alabama avenged that loss, got a great victory in New Orleans, so they'll try and continue the winning ways against the Green Wave coming up later tonight. The men's basketball team tomorrow back at home against Liberty at 7 p.m. The Flames are 1-0 on the season and once again pick to win the A-Sun and will be their final year in the A-Sun after winning the league three of the last four seasons. So they don't say the Crimson Tide certainly have a challenge coming up with Liberty on Friday. We'll continue here on Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR as we start to really get into the show by first hearing from the head coach of the Crimson Tide football team, Nick Saban, as he met with the media on Wednesday. Here is Coach's Checklist as Alabama prepares for Ole Miss. I think one of the biggest challenges we all face is the challenge to create the right habits and what we do day in and day out to do the little things right, um, have fun doing it, have the right energy and enthusiasm, you know, sort of approach things with you know, a disciplined mindset to create those habits. So you're going to have confidence in the fundamental execution. Uh, you got to invest in that in practice and it takes good energy and enthusiasm and focus every day to be able to do that. You know, I was, you know, pretty pleased with the way 
you know, the players did that today. So, you know, hopefully we can build on that and it's going to help our execution come day, game day. You know, we have a lot of respect for Ole Miss. We understand uh, the challenge that we have, um, you know, this Saturday in Oxford. Uh, they got a lot of good players, they're well coached. Uh, it's challenging schemes on both sides of the ball. So uh, we're doing the best we can to get our players ready and confident to be able to play with confidence when the game comes. Um, you know, one thing I'd like to mention, Veterans Day coming up, you know, this week. Um, it's like the I'll take this opportunity to thank, you know, all the veterans who served our country to make the sacrifices they made for the quality of life that maybe so many of us take for granted uh, that we certainly shouldn't. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to feel bad if you have gratitude for what we have and we have you know, one of the greatest countries in the world and all these servicemen have uh, made sacrifices so that we can maintain that and we appreciate what they do more than you know. No, I, I can't tell, uh, you know, you hope that when guys practice well, uh, and I believe in this, that they will play better in the game. But there's so many things that happen in the game, all right, that you have to be able to maintain your individual momentum. I, to be able to play the next play and execute when, you know, your best is needed. I mean, when an old shit moment comes up in the game, you got to be able to play the next play. Just like you got to do the same thing in life. We, we all have issues and things that happen in our life. Some we create, some we don't create. We still have to deal with. But you got to have the right mindset to be able to sustain the right energy level and regain momentum all right, when those things happen. And, you know, that's one of the things that we need to get better at. You know, we talk all the time about playing one play at a time for 60 minutes in a game like it has a history and a life of its own. And no matter what happened on the last play, focus on the next play. Don't look at the scoreboard. Don't worry about the outcome. Just do the things you need to do to get the outcome that you want. And that's something that, you know, we need to improve on. And it's something that's been harped on all year long. So. Even if you practice well, if you don't go in the game, right, game with the right psychological disposition to sustain momentum uh, and how you play, play in and play out, even when things go bad, uh, even when you're playing on the road, it doesn't matter where you're playing, um, then you're not going to be able to maintain the kind of focus you need to be able to execute. Well, I, I think, you know, you could go through all the teams that we play and they they have significant players that have come in from the transfer portal. And Ole Miss certainly has significant players. LSU had significant players last year, last week that, you know, made their team better. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's almost like, can you only build your team in the draft? Or is there such a thing as free agency now in college football? And for years, you know, NFL teams used both of those things to help build their team. And, and I think, you know, some teams are doing that. Uh, some teams probably need to do it a little more than others. And, um, but I think it creates a lot of parity relative to uh, how fast you can rebuild a team, uh, how fast you can sort of get your team where you need to be to be very, very competitive. And, um, you know, I think Ole Miss has done a, Lane's done a great job of that. And you've got a lot of significant players that, um, and you couple that with some good recruiting and it helps your team be really good and they got a really good team. Experience racing like never before from the sandy beaches of Daytona to the high banks of one of the most exciting super speedways on the NASCAR circuit. Don't miss on the 65, 65th running of the Daytona 500 on February 19th, 2023. You can witness history in the making and purchase your tickets today at Daytona International Super Speedway.com. Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR, continues with a conversation with Alabama football's Byron Young. On Tuesday's show, we talked to a member of the offensive line, uh, Javion Cohen, about the play of the offensive line so far this season. But Byron Young has been a stalwart on Alabama's defensive line all throughout the season, had a great game against LSU. Here's our one-on-one -on -one conversation with the Crimson Tide defensive lineman, Byron Young. Byron, we saw you got in the backfield a lot in Baton Rouge. Just what can you tell us about your play on Saturday? Um, you know, Thinking back on the game, you know, I, I wasn't really focused on my play. I was really focused more on the team and, and what I could have done to help the team. And I think getting in the back foot was just me trying to do my part. I think there was stuff that I could have done better, better other than that. But, you know, I was just focused on the team as a whole instead of just me as a person. What did the defense do best on Saturday? 
Um, you know, I think we I think we did a lot of good things, but I think we also did a lot of things that weren't so good. You know, you you look at the mental errors that we had. I know I had some myself. So I think that, um, I mean, I, there's a lot of stuff we could look at that we did good and that we did bad. But I think we really want to focus on what we did wrong to try to figure out what we can do to ride the ship and finish the year out the way we want to finish it. And what was the message from Coach Saban after the game? The message was just, you know, you know, we we put ourselves in the situation that we're in. You know, we made the mistakes that we made. You know, we can't blame anybody else for you know where we are right now but we got to band together and we got to finish the year out the way we want to finish it out and for you as well I mentioned you got in the backfield <clears> some <throat> tackles for a loss some sacks this season we've seen some good celebrations clean like the bow and arrow uh, what can you tell us about that that you've done uh that's just something that I've been doing since um sophomore year that's just that's that's really it uh it's certainly a fun time we get to see that uh how much was it great to have uh, Jaheim Otis back with you guys DJ Dale healthy again it was it was great to have them back you know I was glad to see both of them back on the field um both of them back healthy you know just having them out there was a big help and, and you know I think we'll be good going forward with both of them out there all right now you got Ole Miss coming up this Saturday back on the road in the SEC what's it going to take against another high-powered offense I think it's just going to take us being focused and I think it's just going to take execution uh, being disciplined, you know, that's something that we've been trying to work on all season. And I think that's really just all it's going to take for us is play the game that we need to play. Byron, thank you for joining us. Roll Todd. Yes, sir. Roll. Just take a minute. Look around you. There's history being made. Has been. Will be. And it'll be here sooner than you think. Well, Chris Stewart is very busy at this time of the year as football overlaps with basketball. He got to call the win for the Crimson Tide men's team on Monday night against Longwood. He'll be filling in for Eli, of course, coming up on Thursday with Hay Coach and the Nick Saban Show, plus on Saturday for Alabama football against Ole Miss. And Chris Stewart joins us now to preview what's coming up on a very busy stretch for Alabama athletics with our veteran broadcaster, Chris Stewart. We are in that fun time of the year where we're getting plenty of football to talk about. Basketball is also back as well. Roll Tide, Chris. How's everything going? Roll Tide. And I know you and I were doing play-by-play -play on the same game last night as you had SEC Plus and I had radio. But I'm sitting there uh, in that game on Monday night. And, yes, I know it's the shot clock in basketball. But at least twice, I called it the play clock is down to 10. And, uh, and no dummy, no dummy. Remember where you are, what you're calling. So uh, anyway, it's that's kind of the challenge of it. But it's it is fun, it, and it's fun because it's Alabama football on on the one hand, and Alabama basketball, which is a preseason top twenty team. And based on uh, some of the things we saw last night, Roger, I'm not so sure they're not they're not off on that team. I think that squad um, sooner rather than later is going to be pushing towards uh, top 10 consideration, even though they didn't shoot it well. I just really believe that that's the, the, the way they're going to trend very, very soon. Yeah, we'll stick with basketball for just a moment. Uh, Brandon Miller makes his debut, and we've heard so much about him, Jaden Bradley, really everybody in this number yeah. three uh, recruiting class, the best we've seen at Alabama. And they certainly didn't disappoint on Monday night. No, they didn't. And I'm just looking at a box score as you and I talk, Roger. And Brandon goes for 14 and 13. Mark Sears, your point guard, goes for 13 and 10. So you got or, uh, 12 and 10, excuse me. You got a double double there, but you're three total points away from having four players that would have been recording double doubles. Noah Clowney has nine points, 11 boards. Charles Bediaco, eight points and 12 rebounds. Uh, altered shots inside. I think Alabama collectively had nine block shots, three of them from Nick Pringle off the bench. Uh, their size, their strength, there's athleticism. There's also great shooting ability, even though they only went three of 28 from three. Uh, what these guys have done in their previous uh, weeks leading up to the start of this season, but also they've done for years in their career shows that they're good shooters. They're just, you know, struggling a little bit right now. But, man, you put 75 on the board against a tough, hard-nosed veteran NCAA team, and that's what Longwood is. They got everybody back practically in, in 126 last year with a 15-1 and one, um, tournament or regular season uh, league mark. They're a great basketball team. They really are. They're going to contend in the Big South again. And you 
you shoot just three of 28 from three, still score 75 and win going away, that to me is uh, – it, it gives you even greater excitement and hope about what this team will be than if they had shot 50% from the arc. Well, it doesn't get any easier coming up on Friday with Alabama hosting Liberty, a team that has won the A-Sun three of the last four years. Do you really like yeah. how tough the schedule is going to be in non-conference play? I mean, these are no gimmies in November and December. No, they're they're tough games. They're entertaining games. They're games that make you better win or lose. Uh, and you've got a you've got a real grasp of who you are and what you need to get better at for the next game, regardless of what the outcome is. And it also allows you, if you win games, to have a less than stellar record on face value like last year was, and still be very much an NCAA tournament team. If you if you can win, you got to win some. You know, we don't beat Houston. Uh, in that regular season game, in the, was that December? Mm-hmm. Then you may be uh, eight, nine, ten seed, as opposed to a six seed. That that may be a stretch for one ball game. But my point is, that was a marquee win that you got, and turned out to be a, a big win. And they're going to want us <laughs> when we go back there this year. But that was a huge victory. Um, You've you've got several opportunities like that to build your resume. You can lose every night out, but you've got opportunities to build that resume with each and every ball game. It's not like I've seen it in other years, and it's not just Alabama, other teams as well. You would look at your schedule and go, okay, we got 29 regular season games. And outside of the conference, eh, we got about three that, that you need to be able to get one to help your resume, everything else you know will be wins, but they don't necessarily help you. Um, we're we're going to face somebody that can play every night, and you're going to have to strap it on and get after it, and hopefully that's going to be good for this team. Well, same could be said for Alabama football as we shift gears uh, to the gridiron. Uh, Saturday night in uh, Baton Rouge, a lot of good things happen for this tied football team, but ultimately LSU uh, picks up the two-point conversion to win. Just uh, what were your main takeaways uh, from what we saw Saturday? You know, it's it's funny, Roger. We're sitting here and um, the negative, that, if you want to go the negative route, and I understand it, uh, and it's a realistic thing. It's not just gloom and doom, but the the truth is you could have four or five losses right now very, very easily, very easily. Also, you're two plays away from being undefeated number one in the country on the last play of the game, two plays. Um, and that's when you – what do we have? What would it be? I'm not real good at math, as you know. 25 penalties in two ball games. Tennessee and what happened in Baton Rouge – a combined uh, you know, 26 penalties, I'm sorry. You're sitting there. Otherwise, you know, if, if that's certainly half, but even if you, you shave a third off of that, you probably win both of those football games. So, but you didn't. And, and that's the reality. Here, here's the thing that when in the, your question was about the takeaway, you've got to clean up your own mistakes. Opponents in this league are tough enough to beat when you play well and play a clean game. You can't give them possessions. Um, you can't throw points away, as Alabama did on its opening drive in that game against LSU by throwing the pick in the end zone. You also can't continue to do damage to yourself over the course of the night with the penalties that you commit. Uh, and I know the penalties were basically even on that, but it's still it stopped momentum that was it, bad timing and you know, Bama did catch some breaks in the game and still couldn't get it done because of miscues. I, I think once they take care of themselves and and you know we, we stop beating ourselves, it's gonna be a whole lot easier to beat everybody else. But you gotta fix that quick because I'll, I'll be honest, I was more concerned about Ole Miss coming into this month of November than I was LSU. Uh, and that was even after LSU had beaten the Rebels. So Bama, Bama better be ready on uh, Saturday, and I think they will be. 
And of course, you got to get ready. Uh, starting Thursday, we have Hey Coach and the Nick Saban Show. Uh, Friday, men's basketball against Liberty. And then uh, Saturday, some football with the Rebels. It's going to be an interesting three-day stretch coming up. It's uh, Look, man, it's, it's a good week to be me. There's a lot, but I get to do basketball on Monday. Uh, got a chance on Tuesday to visit with uh, Alabama National Alumni Association group up in Athens, Alabama. Great group up there. Uh, Wednesday, I get to coach my son's rec league basketball game, two games, and I'm trying not to get thrown out uh, of those. And, uh, and then, as you said, the back to the work assignments on the, the rest of the week. And you do uh, Nick Saban show on Thursday. You do basketball Friday and then go do football on Saturday. Uh, man, that's a heck of a week. I'm a very blessed man and looking forward to doing all of it. Hopefully, I get two victories on the Wednesday game, the success on Thursday and Friday uh, and Saturday as well. You always win the coach's show. <laughs> it should be good. Uh, you, I'll take a tie and get out of there. You just survive in advance. Survive That's, in advance. That sounds good. Well, Chris, uh, we look forward to it. Uh, thank you for joining us here on Crimson Drive. Our Roll Tide will see a lot coming up this week. Look forward to it, buddy. Thank you so much. Great conversation with Chris Stewart and just next door at Vaught Hemingway Stadium coming up on Saturday in the other booth. It will be David Kellum, of course, calling the game for the Ole Miss Rebels. And he joins us to give a scouting report on Lane Kiffin's football team as we get set for Alabama against Ole Miss. David, first of all, how is the season going for Ole Miss? A very strong 8-1 and record for the Rebs. Yeah, we've played pretty well most of the year, Roger. It's been an interesting season. We really haven't put together consistently four quarters. Uh, yet we're sitting there eight and one on the years. I don't know why we're complaining about that, but uh, you know, we, we got a lot of portal transfers as, as you kept up with lane went out and did a really good job in that capacity. Uh, and so trying to get them all, all on the same page, playing together. Well, it's, it's been not necessarily a struggle, but uh, a challenge to some degree. And we've got some really good pieces in the puzzle and the puzzle puzzle seems to be coming together a little bit better as we've moved on throughout the season, but uh, young quarterback as well. And so we've had a little bit of growing pains, but all in all, we've, we've done a really nice job. We got off to a great start with LSU and then uh, kind of wilted in that game as it moved on. So that's the only blemish to this point, but played some really good games uh, throughout the course of the year. Yeah, looking back at that LSU game for a moment, what was more surprising, that Ole Miss only scored 20 points or they gave up 45? I think a combination of both based on the way the defense has played uh, this season, you know, I think the defense was put in a tough situation because we, we just couldn't get the ball moving down the field offensively. You now I go back and look at Alabama's game last week, field position in the first part of that game was just a nightmare for the Crimson Tide. And sometimes you always look at the end of a game and you say, oh, look what happened. But the truth of the matter is it could be something early on. We got off to a great start and it was like fool's gold a little bit. LSU got stronger and stronger as the game went on. I've watched all their games early in the year. I thought they were struggling. Quarterback was struggling, but they've kind of gotten it together. So they're uh, you know, climbing the ladder a little bit as far as getting better as the season progresses. And we just ran into a, a tough situation. I think the good start and the LSU hung in there. Next thing you know, uh, you know, we, we're behind the eight ball, just couldn't catch back up. But I think it's more so LSU than, than us to a certain extent. Well, of course, we know Lane Kempton can do wonders with quarterbacks. So we've seen that in Oxford with Matt Corral, saw it here in Tuscaloosa plenty. But what has he done so far with Jackson Dart? How has he fit in this offense and what's led to some success for him? Yeah, you know, it's a little different. You know, Lane is pretty much known for the guy that or he gets the reputation of being pass happy, fast offense. We're still a fast offense, uh, but he looks at analytics a lot and, and we're just strong in a running game. And so we're getting a lot of, of, of running uh, in this particular offense. So it's taking a little pressure off the younger quarterback, if you will. But Jackson will also run. He's got a really good arm. Uh, it's one of those things that uh, as he progresses, he makes all the throws, progresses and learns the offense a little bit more. We're getting stronger on the offensive side. But uh, Lane's been willing to run a, a great deal. I think it's one of the misconceptions about about him. If he's got a strong running game, he's going to use it. He, he lets analytics kind of dictate where he needs to go and uh, as a game progresses and as the offense that he has. So Jackson's done well. I think he's helped him tremendously. Uh, Lane is incredible with quarterbacks, and you can see he's playing with a lot of confidence, even though he's a, a young quarterback. What makes Zach Evans such a good running back? 
You know, Zach had such a cr- tremendous career at, at TCU, very confident, veteran uh, runner. We he had a little bit of a nick and an injury. We missed him uh, for the LSU game, which was tough, not having him in the in the mix. But a really good runner, gets north and south quickly, can, can hit the edges uh, as well. And he's been fun to watch. He's been a great addition to to that room. You know, you remember a year ago, uh, Roger, we we sitting there with – Snoop Connor, Jerry Neely, I and mean, we had a really good running back room last season. And at the beginning of this year, a lot of the coaches kind of talking about we may be even better there before we saw, you know, Judkins, Bentley, and also Zach Evans. And th- it's really good. It's a, it's a good threesome. We've had some injuries to slow it down a little bit, but uh, Zach has been a huge addition to this team. And then once again, Jonathan Mingo seems like he's having a great year. Yeah, Jonathan's a great target. He's he's been one of those guys kind of waiting in the wings to be the next receiver to step up and, and have an opportunity. I think he's a pro receiver for sure. Good frame, uh, tough across the middle, can can go after the deep ball as well. And uh great target and a good good uh you know receiver for Jackson Dart. It gives him somebody that he can throw the one on one ball and, and see if Mingo can go get it, but he's had a really good year. And he, he's finally had that season. He's had some injury issues. He's finally having that season that we all anticipated he'd have at some point. And then on the defensive side of the ball for the Rebels, who are some of the key playmakers our fans need to know about? Well, I think on the edge, Cedric Johnson is an Alabama guy from the state of Alabama. He's uh, another one of those kind of waiting his turn to, to move up, and he's done a really wonderful job off the edge. Uh, we've gotten really good play in the middle. Uh, to keep some pressure going there. So the front the front has helped, um, you know, the defensive backfield to a great extent. We also have uh, Troy Brown transferred from Central Michigan. Troy's, Troy's one of those guys that also got banged up a little bit, and we, we lost him for a while. And then A.J. Finley on the backside. So the kind, it's kind of like a baseball analogy. Up the middle, uh, we're, we're pretty doggone good. And, and so we've had some success there. Maybe defensive backfield maybe one of the better ones we've had in a long, long time. But, you know, sometimes they get out of position, have some issues. I think the transfer portal and all the newness of that, uh, Coach Parker's done a wonderful job of, of getting those guys in the right spot and doing doing well. So we, we're, we feel pretty good about the defense. But it goes back to, again, on really on both sides of the ball, we haven't put together that complete game. You look at the Georgia Tech game, you say, well, that was pretty complete. I mean, we kind of blew them away, to say the least. But – uh, but I, I think there's still, you know, we're not at the ceiling yet. Still got a chance with three tough games left to, to be even better on both sides of the ball. Well, again, the Rebels led by head coach Lane Kiffin, who had time at Alabama as the offensive coordinator under Coach Saban, obviously coached in this league as well before at Tennessee. Just uh, how have you seen him uh, continue to embrace Ole Miss now in his third season? Uh, the great results last year, I'm sure, made everybody feel good, and he's kept it up this year too. Well, you know, Lane made that statement early in the year that that Oxford has been good for me. People keep saying that I'm good for Oxford and Ole Miss, but it's been good for me. And, uh, you know, I didn't know Lane when he was at Alabama. Chris Stewart and I have talked a lot about about Lane, and I think he's matured dramatically uh, from what I'm hearing. And just here at Ole Miss, uh, he surrounded himself with some really good coaches. I mean, you think about what he did this this past season. We lost half our staff got wiped out on a lot of players. He went out and hired some really good coaches and fixed everything with a portal, got some tremendous high school talent too. So I think recruiting, he's, you know, A-plus there. Uh, who he's surrounding himself, he's A-plus. And I, I just think that he's he's really now embraced the the head coaching piece uh, even more. And he's, he's kind of letting other people do things, if you will, and not trying to be just a one-man show to some degree. And uh, you know, he's still fun. I mean, he hadn't changed a bit when it comes to social media and having a good time with that. But I think a lot of it's kind of tongue in cheek with him. But uh, he's been fun to, to be around and uh, he has embraced Ole Miss. And there's no question Ole Miss has embraced him. Well, it's certainly good to hear. And speaking of coaches that are being embraced by Ole Miss, uh, Mike Bianco, the baseball coach for mm-hmm. the Rebels, a national championship this past year. Obviously, Alabama played well last time we saw you guys in Oxford. Yeah. But uh, just what can you tell us about the journey afterwards for that baseball team and how meaningful it was for you to get to call a national championship for Ole Miss? Oh, it was really special. I've been doing it a long, long time. I got tickled that, that Stanford was there again. And, you know, they don't, in the SEC, we're so used to these mega networks and super attention toward baseball, incredible facilities and all this. And so I go over and meet the Stanford two announcers. 
Roger, and they're two sophomores in college. <laughs> and they've been to the College World Series two years in a row, and I think they're calling it online or for one station. I, I, I really wanted to punch them. <laughs> you know, having, <laughs> having been involved in baseball for 40-plus years, I've only been to Omaha a couple of times. But uh, I was really happy for Mike, uh, taking my personal piece out of it. But Mike and Cammie have been awesome in our community. Uh, he's going to do the lights for the, the square, you know, and so that's like the greatest honor in the world in Oxford to, to put the two things together and boom, light up the square. So forget the national championship. That's a whole lot bigger, but uh, he's been great. He's been wonderful. It, it, it kind of now brings everything together of the accomplishments. I and mean, we've been in the postseason regular basis, but you mentioned Alabama. It was a weird season and I don't want to get too deep into baseball, but it was one of those years where, where I did an interview a few months ago where they asked, well, that's the most fun you've ever had calling a baseball season. I said, no, for a month and a half, it was miserable. I mean, you know, we got swept by Tennessee, lost Alabama. We had just tough times, and once got the pitching figured out, we lost some key pieces there and got Graham back, who was hurt. All of a sudden, things started working. It's just a great sports story, to be honest with you. If you pull off the old Miss piece and just look at that team, it's a really cool story where those guys just kept fighting, kept battling, had a chance, and eventually got it done. And of course, we get to Omaha, and there's the SEC West. Everybody's out there. There's four teams from the West in Omaha. But uh, it, it was a special year for Mike and his staff. Well, he had a lot of us rooting for you, and congratulations again on that accomplishment. Uh, won't be rooting for you on Saturday as the Crimson No, Spider I figured was- not. <laughs> but uh, we're certainly excited for the trip to Oxford. And, David, thank you so much for joining us here on the network and giving us a sound report in Ole Miss. Thank you again. All right, Roger. Good to see you, man. Switching gears on Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR from football to soccer. We're all so excited. We've been excited all season long for the progress Alabama soccer has made under the direction of head coach Wes Hart, winning the regular season championship in the SEC. And now Alabama is the nation's number one seed entering the NCAA tournament. And he joins us to recap what a great season it's been so far for Alabama, plus what lies ahead in the NCAA tournament. Here's a one-on-one conversation with Crimson Tide soccer head coach, Wes Hart. How was Selection Monday hearing Alabama announced as a number one seed? Yeah, pretty, pretty exciting. Um, you know, we were we were confident going into the selection show that uh, that we had done enough to um, obviously at least secure a number two seed. But uh, but we felt that, you know, with our resume, you know, the number of top 50 wins, the number of top 25 wins we had, uh, we knew we had a pretty decent shot at a, at a number one seed. And so, you know, getting that here in our names called was uh, was was pretty exciting. Um, and now, um, you know, we're, uh, we're ready for uh, Jackson State and uh, um, excited for that game on Friday. Of course, you guys got together last year to hear your name called going to the NCAA tournament. Uh, does it just strike you as a difference in emotion uh, from hearing last year, hey, we're in versus now, hey, we are the number one seed? <laughs> yeah, I kind of like this year better going into the end of the show, knowing that you're already in and, and just waiting uh, which, uh, which seed you are. But uh, now last year was cool because. I don't know, just a, a super stressful time, right? I mean, you're 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 walking in there, and and it really could have gone either way last year, and um, you know, so it's just kind of a, a different kind of excitement, a different kind of emotion, more of a, I don't know, a, a relief, I guess. Um, you know, getting in um, this year was you know just just different because you know we, we knew we had a, a spot locked in, and now it's just a matter of how high that seed was. So uh, both of them exciting, uh, but just kind of different, I guess, levels of stress. Well, this past week for the Crimson Tide, a time in Pensacola, Florida at the SEC tournament. Just what were your main takeaways from the play uh, we saw from your team in three games? Yeah, you know, um, clearly the the competitor in us, you know, wanted to to walk away from uh, from Pensacola with uh, with another trophy. We wanted to to kind of. I don't know, not kind of, we, we wanted to, we wanted to win the tournament. Obviously we went, we went down there with the intention of, of winning. Um, I thought we played well in, uh, in the three games. Uh, just kind of ran out of steam at the end. Um, you know, it was, uh, I don't think it was a, a bad performance by our, by our part, but, uh, you know, South Carolina had a good game plan. They, they sat in, they, uh, they were difficult to break down. Um, and, um, you know, just, we weren't, weren't sharp enough, weren't quite good enough on the, on the day. Um, still had, still had some chances, still had a lot of the ball, a lot of territory, which, uh, which we value, um, but just not enough, uh, not enough quality to, to get the job done, but uh, certainly don't want that to take away from anything that we've done this season. You know, our team has been, been incredible all year long. I think we'd won 14 games in a row prior to that. Um, you know, obviously, you know, swept the, the regular season 10 and 0, um, you know, won the Iron Bowl, won the SEC West, 
you know, smashed, you know, a lot of different school records. And so we certainly have a, a lot to hang our hat on and, uh, and be proud about. Um, and so certainly don't want that to, to, to sour the season at all. And of course, you and I have talked so much this season about all the goals that have been scored, but how about the defense uh, starting with McKinley Crone, what she's been able to do. She was named the SEC all tournament team, Sasha Pickard as well. And then obviously Raina Reyes has made such an impact this year on the back line. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, because of how good our attack has been, you know, the, the defense has been a little bit overshadowed. But, I mean, you look at, uh, you know, I mentioned some of our school records that uh, that we've smashed and, you know, our goals against average and shutouts and all those records have been broken too, but uh, just hasn't been talked about uh, probably enough. You know, these last couple of weeks, I think we've been trying to, to bring it up a bit more. But, um, but yeah, our uh, our defending in general. And, and when we talk about our attack or our defense, you know, we, we, we try not to single out specific positions because ultimately, you know, all 11 players on our, on the field at any given time are attackers when we have the ball and, and we're all defending when we don't. So, you know, it really kind of starts with, uh, with that front line and that press that we do and, and the midfielders stepping up and, and, and of course the, the back line. So, you know, um, but, uh, but you, you, you certainly got to, got to, Got to make sure that uh, that those backs and and even Macy Clem as a holding midfielder and Kinley Crone as a goalkeeper, you know they got to, you know they, they they've done an incredible job for us all year long and, and keeping the ball out of the net and uh, limiting opponents' chances. And McKinley as well, she's getting some uh, recognition for some of the great uh, aerial attacks she's had uh, trying to stop some goals. Are you always impressed with how air when she gets airborne, the kind of plays she can make? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've uh, I've always thought McKinley's kind of best attributes are her just her calmness and her composure. I mean, she uh, she does not get rattled, which which you know keeps our our team in front of her, you know, calm and, and composed. And so you know, just you know, her comfort level on the ball, um, you know, her connection to the back line, her voice, her organizing, you know, all of that stuff is what I've always been really impressed with. But you know, these uh, these past few weeks, you know, she's made big saves when we needed them. She's kept us in games. Um, and she's been, she's been playing, uh, you know, her, at her, at her highest level that, uh, that I've seen. And you know, that's exactly what you want this time of year. You know, when we're going into the, you know, going into the NCAA tournament, you want your players playing at their best and there's no doubt, you know, McKinley's at her best right now. Well, this year he gets to be at home for the NCAA tournament to get it going uh, against Jackson state after last year, going on the road to Clemson, getting a big win there. Uh, just what kind of difference does it make being at home uh, for these NCAA tournament matches in the early rounds, hopefully. And then, uh, what can you tell us about Jackson state? Yeah, I think it's huge. Um, you know, obviously we've uh, we've been very good at home. Um, I think it's been you know well over a year since we've lost at home. Um, you know, perfect at home this year. You know, we've had some incredible crowds that, without question, have helped us win a, a couple games that uh, that we won this year. Um, so you know, from a, just from a crowd standpoint and just the environment, it's, it's going to be awesome. Um, you know, another uh, another thing that I look at is I mean, we're just on the road for you know, eight straight days in, in Pensacola, which was, which was awesome. But at the same time, it's nice to, to be back home, sleeping in our beds, you know, our, our players able to go to, you know, get back, go to school, get back in a normal routine. So that's going to be nice. You know, we had another road trip earlier this year where we were in, you know, Miami for five days, we were in Utah for seven days. Um, so I think we're, we're excited to just be, be home. And, <laughs> and like I said, get back into, into normal routine. So that'll, that'll be great. You know, as for uh, Jackson state, um, you know, like any opponent we've played this year, you know, our, our focus, our emphasis is going to be on us and, and not about our opponents. So, you know, no disrespect respect to, to Jackson State, but it's the same when we played South Carolina or Arkansas or Tennessee or anyone else. You know, our focus is on us. And, you know, we feel that if uh, if we're good at what we do, you know, our press, our hunt, our transition, you know, our movement, our activity off the ball, all of those things that uh, that we stress, you know, day in and day out. If we're good in those areas, um, I, li I like our chances Friday. Well, we'll look forward to seeing Alabama against Jackson State as the Crimson Tide begins its run in the NCAA tournament. Uh, Coach Hart, just thank you so much for joining us, and hopefully we'll be doing this for the next several weeks, uh, talking about more Crimson Tide soccer ahead. But best of luck. Thank you again. Awesome, man. Roger, I appreciate you all year long, and uh, roll tide. Best of luck to Wes Hart and the Crimson Tide soccer team as they gear up for the NCAA tournament, starting with the first round tomorrow against Jackson State at 6 p.m. here on campus at the Alabama Soccer Stadium. It's part of a very busy weekend of Crimson Tide athletics, and with that, it is time for our Wickles Weekend Update. It's brought to you by Wickles Pickles. They are wickedly delicious. You can find out more at wickles.com. Let's see what's coming up on the network this week. 
Well, coming up later tonight, it will be women's basketball, first of all, in New Orleans against the Tulane Green Wave, starting at 6 o'clock across the network. And then at 6.30, we will have Hey Coach and the Nick Saban show as well, as Coach Saban will join Chris at the restaurant to preview Alabama against Ole Miss. Coming up on Friday, we will have the This Week on CTSN podcast, getting you ready as a full preview for Alabama and Ole Miss with the best of our content from the past five days. And then at night at 6 p.m., we will start our coverage for the 7 o'clock tip-off for Alabama men's basketball against Liberty as the Crimson Tide try to improve to 2-0 on the season. Then it's football on Saturday, of course, 2.30 at Ole Miss. Our radio airtime will be at 11.30 a.m. from Oxford. Sunday, we'll take a look back at the football game with the Nick Saban television show as well as Tide TV this week, looking at all Crimson Tide athletics. And then we'll recap everything coming up on Monday with Crimson Tide Rewind. Corey Reamer and I will have the show coming up at Baumhauer's Victory Grill in Vestavia Hills at 6 p.m. Speaking of Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR, don't miss out on your chance to experience the energy and the excitement of the iconic Daytona 500. Witness history in the making and purchase your tickets today at DaytonaInternationalSuperspeedway.com. It's going to wrap up this Thursday edition of Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR. It's been a very busy show. We certainly have to say thank you to Byron Young and the Alabama football team for joining us, as well as Chris Stewart, David Kellum, and Wes Hardigan. Good luck to the Crimson Tide soccer team. We've had so much fun watching them all fall long. Now we're hoping for the best in the NCAA tournament. Thanks as well to Ethan Carabin, our video producer, for putting all of this show together. And thanks for you for watching on this Thursday afternoon. It's going to be a big weekend at Crimson Tide Athletics. Certainly hope you can join us here on the Crimson Tide Sports Network. This is Roger Hoover saying so long from Tuscaloosa and Roll Tide.